So you're thinking right now, you're not, you weren't kidding about this crazy thing. But um, now what, what we did is, if you're just joining us, what's, what standard practice, I know it sounds very unspiritual, but what we've, what we've typically done is we've tackled the book of the Bible and we go through that book and then out of whatever uh, the next section of scripture, some kind of topic pops up, right? We talk about that. And so between books, we finished 1 John and... When we were getting close to that, we put a suggestion box up. Long story short, people put suggestions in. Here's some topics in between the two books that I, like, that I would love for you to address. And so this is one of them we got here. And we thought, wow, how important, the prophetic implications of tacos. Well, I'm not really going to talk about that, but I thought that was a funny request that we got in there. Um, yeah, so we, you know, we want to honor that in a way. I thought it was worth mentioning, but it's a little lighter hearted than what we'll really talk about. Um, so today, really, what we're going to talk about, we've been on, on a journey, if you weren't with us. We kind of started with creation, then we began to talk about, um, you know, how that affects uh, men and women, right? Like in creation, we were created by God in his image, man, male, female, God brought us together. Then there was the fall of man in the garden, if you're familiar with, with that account in Genesis. And on the back end of that, there were certain curses put down that put us a little bit at odds with the world around us, which was also cursed, but also with each other. But then God said, this is good that you're together. Why don't you live together and good luck with navigating this, right? So no wonder we have these struggles, male, female, sharing one life together. So we started talking about marriage and, and how that affects that, what God says about that, divorce, how um, that ends up happening even though it wasn't God's desire or will. But we talked about God's grace. Then we talked about husbands and wives' responsibilities because if we don't want to get divorced, let's talk in a positive way about how we are supposed to treat one another. And then, and then we also intertwined in that as much as it might sound very like un church. We talked about how the dynamics of sex are involved in that. Because ultimately, what we found in the scripture is as difficult as marriage is, one of the great reasons we have it is because God created in us sexual desires, needs, and also wanted us to procreate. Fair enough? Okay. Now, this is leading to some other topics that you guys had said, hey, Will, I would love, love for you to talk about because these don't typically come up in in your, re your regular Sunday morning sermons. And we just love talking about really lighthearted, easy things around here lately, it seems like. Surprise anybody comes back for more. Um, let me pray, and then we'll get into that. Lord, I want to be more like you, and I'm just not. I, but I, I pray, and my desire is that I would continue to change and grow and learn. Uh, Lord, I pray that you would give me your words and your, your vision and your heart, that I could share this truth, but also share, share it in a practical way as well. And I pray, Lord, that you, through your spirit, that you would just fill me and out of me would come words that people would say, it's true what you're saying, but I feel like you're saying it in love. But your love doesn't make it any less true. And that's what I pray, Lord, that you would take this, whatever I can offer, my, my mouth is a mouthpiece, Lord, that you would touch the hearts of the men and the women of all ages here, Lord, and that you would help them become more like you. And then as they're going through this, Lord, that you would make us a people who share, share that you're our Lord, you're in our life, and even though we're still trying to walk this out, we would invite them to come walk it out too. And I just pray that in your name, Jesus. Amen. So ultimately, here's the thing. Here's what I can example for you. I'm about to share stuff with you, just like I have all the rest of these weeks, that I don't have dialed in 100%. I'm really not that great of a husband, okay? I'm really not. Like, I am as bad as the next guy. I make those mistakes. As a matter of fact, I know from talking to you that when we get into marriage and gender issues and sex issues, like, our, our homes are crazy right now. Because once God is bringing this up and working on it, if you're listening and if you're engaging in the process, there's going to be a little bit of struggle. There's going to be growing pains. And I think a lot of you, including in my house, were experiencing that. But what's exciting about that, as much as it's heartbreaking and hard, 
at the same time as, thank you, Lord, man. Like, oh. So that's when it's like, I'm going to see a victory. That's what I need, right? I need a breakthrough. Like, right? Because I'm going to see a victory because the battle belongs to the Lord. So in this, in our marriages, in our, in our sexuality, in fighting against this curse, we're all just singing, I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory. For the battle belongs to the Lord. See, now you know I'm not the singer, right? I'm the pastor. But, but what we can't keep, we can't get away from, and I have to remind you, and it's making my sermons long, and I'm sorry, okay? So that's probably why some people are afraid of this. But I've got to remind you and put it in context. What we're dealing with with all of these situations, please understand something, is this. What should be versus what is. Okay? So we go back to that, right? We go back to that. A husband, give yourselves up for your wife. Live with her in an understanding way. That's what should be. How are you doing? Right? Because the dynamic of this is I'm going to have, you know, on any given day, man, maybe it's a dozen choices to make as a husband and father where I can demand my own right and be selfish or give myself up for my wife. But at the end of the day, her experience of that day is going to be how I did with that, right? And then in turn, the Bible's talking to her about submitting to me, right, and loving me and the way that she's doing that, respect, all the... She's going to have so many choices any given day. To do that or not to do that, to get concerned with self, to get afraid... And, and we can make those mistakes. Now, I am in no way saying, oh, man, that's great. You know, Steve, I'm really glad that you're, don't, don't worry, you're not giving yourself up for your wife. That's, that's fine. You know, hey, you know. Oh, Evelyn, I, I, that's cool if you don't want to submit to your husband. I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying we've got to battle with what should be versus what is. And that's why when we're going through this, we want a victory because what we're doing is that metaphor I keep coming back to. It's that practice. You are practicing. And really, being some of the conversations I've had this week, I have to share this with you. When we are practicing this, Christians, what we're called to do is like to let the world see we're practicing this. And by that, I mean everywhere that we go. Like, it's not an accident you work where you work and you live where you live and you interact with certain people. And some of us feel like I've got to achieve some kind of level. I've got to get like pastor level like Will, and then I could share about Jesus. Spoiler alert, some of this stuff you got better than I in your life. Yet I'm called to share this every week, whether I feel like it or not, because I know it's true. Whether I feel condemned or down or not, right? It's a fight. That's why I need a victory. So don't forget what should be versus what is. We'll go back to that. What should be. Here's the, here's the, here's the direction I want to give you. Because when we're looking at all this stuff, I want you to think about like this. This is what God is teaching me that I want to share with you. What should be. When I'm considering what should be, and Jay, when I think about this, man, I got to look at this and say, okay, what should be is A, right? What should be, give myself up for my wife. What should be, you know, don't fall into sexual temptation. What should be, don't get angry. What should be, don't gossip. What should be, what should be. That's what I have to consider when I look at myself. Because the life of a Christ follower has to examine themselves. That's what you're signing up for. I'm examining myself so I can confess where I'm making a mistake, agree with God, and he can work in this through his power and through time. So what should be is what I hold myself accountable to. What should be, you, Shar, can't hold Jay to. What is, is where you offer compassion and grace. What is, is where I come back to this, because God gives me grace, he gives me mercy, forgiveness, love, and gives me life. It is what he's asking me to do, is to give that same back to you, because I need it, you need it as well. So my kids that are sitting over here, right? Man, I really want God to forgive me, offer me grace and mercy. I definitely need to give that to them. Does that make sense? Okay, we're putting it in context. So what is, that's where I have to offer compassion. I don't say it's okay, right? I don't want my, I don't want my wife to say, oh, it's okay that you're not giving, your, you're getting selfish. 
I don't want you to say, oh, you're a horrible gossip, but I'm cool with it, Will. No, I don't want you to say that, okay? In the relationship, we can challenge one another. But what I'm not doing is saying, I'm not your Holy Spirit. I'm not, you aren't doing what God said. Now, obviously, in relationships, sometimes you let people in. You say, can you help me? I'm struggling. Will you, will you tell me when I'm making this mistake? And that person, by all means, should tell you, I see you doing this. And then you'll get defensive, right? <sighs> okay, but ultimately, when we look at all of these matters, it is for you and I to look at ourselves and to ask God to help us grow into what he's calling us to be. And then calls for us to look at others with compassion and truth and love. Okay, now let's go forward here. Let me, let me say we're coming out of this, and, and for whatever reasons we're going through the Scripture, um, we're seeing intertwined in this section of Scripture the issue with sexual immorality, right? The importance of doing sex God's way. And all the fallout that happens when we don't do that. So just so that you don't think I'm talking, talking off the top of my head, let me give you a scripture. This is from a letter which was written by the Apostle Paul to the church at Corinth. And so we, we identify it by 1 Corinthians, the first letter, chapter 6, verse 18. It says, flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Let me put this in context. When you think of sexual immorality, you think about actions and thoughts. The word here is actually an action word. The root word that this is coming from, in that time, their sexual immorality in a lot of ways, because they didn't have the internet and that kind of stuff, it was prostitution. There was a physical, sexual, illicit sexual intercourse, incest, sex outside marriage, adultery. That's all in this. Okay? Verse 19, or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price, so glorify God in your body. So first of all, he's saying, flee from it. Don't go towards sexual immoral things. And why this is super important is because other sins, a lot of sins that we commit are outside of our body. But sexual morality is something we do with our body. And why that is more hazardous is because you've got to understand that your body, once you accept Jesus and the Holy Spirit indwells with you, your body is the house, is the temple for the Holy Spirit. And, and we come to these buildings and we think this is a holy place. Man, I have to tread lightly in this building. This is a building. We're, we're treating ourselves poorly, but this building better. How, how does that make sense? Like, when you leave... Come by sometime, man. You come by, I'll let you in. You can check it out. There's like, it's not a holy place when you guys all leave. It really isn't. It's a building. It smells funny. They used to have cars in here and stuff, right? You are the holy dwelling place of God. So when you do sex the wrong way, you're basically imposing that on the Holy Spirit. That's why this matters. Now, in our culture, we've got a lot of other, other ways that aren't interacting physically, but mentally. Jesus talks about that in Matthew 5, 28. He tries to tell you, hey, I'm glad you're really proud of yourself that you don't, you know, have sex with women you're not married to, but the minute you look at them with lustful intent, and you're, you might as well have just done it. Okay, so now we've kind of tied most of us in, right? Like men and women, we've had these thoughts, these feelings. We should flee from those because if we act on them, we're imposing the Holy Spirit, right, the temple of God, into a broken place sexually. Man, what do we do about that? Well, okay. What should be, according to what Paul's writing us? You can go forward to 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 2. So you're, if you're taking notes, that's great. Um, also, this will be on YouTube later if you need to come back and get some of those scriptures. If you're part of the email list, I know Josh has been typing up kind of a recap. So you have the slides and all the references so that you can look at this more at home. Um, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 7, 2, but because of the temptation to sexual morality. Let me pause there. So he makes a case in the previous chapter that sexual morality is a big deal. Let me ask you, in the world around you, is it a big deal? Yeah. Do you see it? In your life, is it a big deal? It's something you have to be aware of. 
Yeah. Okay. Now, what should be, Paul is saying, because of this temptation to sexual morality. See, he's not going to what, what should be. When he talks about what should be, he says, it'd be better if you guys didn't have that pull towards sexual morality because then you could commit your life to God. But what is, is that you're going to suffer with this. And because of that, what should be, back to that, is because of the temptation to sexual morality, each man should have his own wife and each woman her own husband. And a lot of times we just stop there in church. Well, that's what the Bible says. Right? That's what the Bible says. So that's good enough. Well, how's that working? Is it easy in marriage to work this out? It's just not. Let's talk for a minute about what is. What is a sexual harm? And man, I want to say this with such great compassion. I mean, statistics are, are like heartbreaking how many people are abused, right? Sexually as kids. Like the chances are there's a good portion of you who've been wronged in a physical or sexual way that made it unsafe, that makes it very difficult to do the what should be. And depending on your family of origin, some of you are way affectionate. Others, you are a little bit physically more standoff. And one is not evil and one is not good. This is what is. And then you got crazy things like the food we're eating, guys, are poisoning us over time. So some of our functions die as we get older, right? Even before they die before us. And then you have accidents and all these other things. What is, is we have a world full of sexual harm. Are you tracking with me still? I don't want to, I mean, there's a lot of information, but I don't want to, I don't want to leave you behind in this. You can see this, right? You can live this. Like we talked about singleness. Like, oh yeah, everyone who's single is just like, man, I'm good. I don't ever really think about getting physical with anyone. It's easy. Maybe some people, but other people, that's a battle, especially if, if you're really single, what you see for a time and you don't want to rush. You haven't found someone to be a mate with. So then you can't do all the matings or the rituals, right? But you'd sure like to. And what about in our culture where we prolong adolescence? We're like 30-year-olds or kids. So they can't get married yet, but they got all those hormones. I mean, look at them already. They're already like, I can see them. They got mustaches and they wear bras. Like, it's happening to them whether you like it or not. But they still got to go to high school and middle school, and they're not ready to get married. What about for them? What is, is that's a huge temptation. When they go to buy bubble gum, they use sex to sell it. Right? So here's what was requested in the box. And here's what I know, okay? Here's what I know. I know in church, man, like, oh, can you tell the world? Can you tell the world, Will? Can you tell the world that we're right? Can you tell them? Can you tell them about abortion and how bad that is? Can you tell them about homosexuality and what the Bible says about that? Can you address these gender confusion issues, right? Yeah, could you get canceled so you can never run for president? Sure, I'm, I'm already doing that for sure. Like, uh, this is on the internet, like, that's good, right? Okay, I don't want to run for president or be whatever, be famous. I will talk about that, but let me tell you, I know a lot of the things that came in there is we all have these pet issues, and the reason why is because we don't want to look at ourselves. Can we look at the people who are having abortions? As you're sitting over here addicted to porn, right? Oh, man, the homosexuality, that's like a big issue, man. I can't believe they're doing that when you had an abortion, right, or something, right? Like, so we just do this to each other because I don't want to face the muck and the mud in me. I don't want to face how much I need this. Like, oh, man, Jigger, dude, I need this, like, already this morning. But I'm not a coward. But here's what's going on. The problem is this. The root problem of all of those, why I'm bulking them together, is a couple root problems here. And one of them is we don't believe God. Now let me change that around. I don't believe God. You can't say, no, I want to be honest. We don't believe God. 1 Corinthians, Paul was saying this to that same group of believers. Chapter 1, verse 18. For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it's the power of God. 
Now, in context, it's talking about what's happened, right, with the resurrection and the cross. This sounds silly, but the same could be applied to everything that God's commanding us to do. It says that his ways are not our ways. They're so much higher above, we don't get it. We don't see clearly. We don't see over time. We see right now. We're finite. So the things that God says to do seem really foolish sometimes. Well, a lot of times. Let's be honest. And we don't believe him, that he sees and knows better. So we believe instead that we know better. Here's an example in the culture. Every generation, I'm not going to pick on you guys. Look at everyone around you, depending on how much gray hair they have. They had a rebellious generation too. And that rebellious generation, as you begin to grow up and get older and get more, um, more understanding, more independence, more knowledge, right? You begin to think, ah, oh, I'm getting this life thing dialed in and everyone who came before me is foolish. Right? I mean, we did it. Like, okay, like, like the people in the 60s weren't doing that. Or the people in the 70s or 80s kids or 90s kids or millennials or Gen, Gen Z, right? Like, oh, we're just so much more evolved than we used to be. You guys are still doing war. We're over that. Let's have peace, man. Let's just make love, not war, right? Technology. Oh, man, it's going to be like flying cars in the future. We know old people are dumb. We're smart. Right? Thought I was going to take over the world, 90s kid, 2,000 kids. Yeah, man, you guys are working your life away. I'm just going to, like, live in the basement and do that. Like, I know better, right? And now, and now like, with our, we've got Wally coming to life with the cell phones in front of our face everywhere that we go, right? So we think what these people are saying is true. We think our knowledge is better than God. And because, because of what is instead of what should be, we've thrown out what should be, and we deal with what is. Does that make sense? Because... We are not seeing what should be. We, we're grasping on to what is, and we're actually changing that into what should be. And that's confusing. I get it, right? Let, let, let me give you, for example, we hit back on our marriages. If marriages aren't working, creating love, right, if they don't see that kind of interaction, then they think marriages are loveless. So although ideally is marriage is a loving place, what is is sometimes it's not. Because we get hurt, we hurt each other. So people watch that and they say, oh, you know what should be? Marriages are not the loving place. Outside the marriage is the loving place. And now the culture tells you things like, you're 20, you don't get married. I mean, I got married when I was 20. You would have thought I had leprosy, guys. Try to go to ASU when you're 20 and married. I mean, they, they looked at me like I had a second head. Like, really? Like, why would you do that? That is so... Dumb, that's not, why don't you go out and experience life and find yourself and sow your wild seeds? I mean, that's what the should be of the culture was in 1999. We said 1999, that sounds older, right? Back in the year of our Lord, 1999. That was the prevailing thought. Even my neighbors who lived together, who had a dog, which I didn't have, if we split up, we would have had to sign papers. They would have had to share custody of a dog, right? So how, how much more foolish is that what I'm doing than what they're doing? Well, it's because the idea of what should be changed. So then the church is way behind. You guys don't get what should be. Duh. Because they think they know what should be. So we believe we know better than God and that he doesn't know. He doesn't do, let me say it this way. We believe that we know better in God, and he's not really who he says he is. He won't do what he says he's going to do. Like, I run into this all the time. I'm like God's best assistant, and he doesn't even know it, right? Like, I can get things done for him, apparently. Only the reality is that doesn't work. The reality is I have to wait for him to get certain things done that I can't get done on my own. As a matter of fact, I can't care for my own needs. I live in inter interdependent relationships with all of mankind, right? The electricity I turn on, the water that comes out of the faucet. I mean, maybe I could learn to get some of those things. I have to trust God. And then I don't believe him half the time. And then we make this excuse. But if he knew what I was going through. I know that's what should be, Will, but if you knew what I was going through, I 
Okay, so in light of that, let's come back to one of the topics, abortion. Abortion's bad. It's widespread. It has been throughout history, right? We've done it different ways. And what's, what, well, I'll tell you one thing. Let me encourage you people who would call themselves Christians and believe. This is not the core issue of all Christianity. And I feel like a lot of times people want to make it this. It is murder. It is murder. It's not good. Okay, that's true. I want you to hear this. Proverbs 6, 16 through 19. There are six things. This is where we could find one of the areas we could really find a biblical basis to say abortion's wrong. So let me show it to you. There are six things that the Lord hates, seven that are an abomination to him. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood. There it is. A heart that devises wicked plans and feast, or feet that make haste to run to evil a false witness who breathes out lies and one who sows discord among brothers. As a matter of fact, just to show that God was serious about this, in Exodus 21, there's this cross-reference I've put here, Exodus 21, verses 22 through 25, basically what it says is, you know, like if you, if you kind of run into or hurt a pregnant woman, then if the baby's, you know, hurt but not killed or she's hurt, then you might have to pay some kind of restitution or fee or penalty to the husband. But if you kill that baby in her womb, then you are killed. So the unborn baby was treated like a human life when God gave him the rules. But here's what's funny, okay? Here's what I think is so funny about us Christians, and I'm no different. How many things did the Lord hate? In that, in that, six and seven were abomination, right? So when we want to pick on one, we got to throw the same number of darts at all of those things. And as a matter of fact, I would say some of the people up in arms about some of these things, like you, you get up in arms about one of these items, oftentimes you actually are guilty of one of the other ones in the service of hating one of those. But the scripture says God's against all of those. Do you see that? Like, and this is what we can do. I can get a vendetta against abortion, which is bad. And if you have kids, if you've ever been pregnant, like, you know that that's alive, right? You know that that baby's alive. And here's the other thing. Statistics will tell you whatever they want, okay? I'll throw one out at you, and I don't know that the number's exactly right, but it should, it should make my point, okay? I'm telling you that every one of them, every one of you, depending, no matter how long it's been since you've been in the womb, you are a miracle, a definite miracle, because science, which is not trying to prove God's right, is finding this, that the chances of you being conceived to become who you are, right? We're talking about how you look, the genetic code. It had to be a particular egg and a particular sperm. And so the mathematical odds of that happening between that and ovulation and all that stuff is one in four quadrillion. One in four quadrillion. One in four quadrillion, you. One in four quadrillion, your kids. Well, you might have added one extra. Okay, I don't, I don't care if I added 10 extra zeros. And then you take that into matter. Your parents were each one in four quadrillion. And their parents were one in four quadrillion. And their parents, I mean, it is impossible that you were born. Like, impossible if it weren't for God. And a lot of women, you know what comes out too is like, if you, if you ever suffer from like a miscarriage, all of a sudden you'll begin to see other people will share their stories and you're like, miscarriages are widespread. Like God, God, you know, doesn't deliver every baby term to term. So like he has a plan and a will. And I don't know what it is, why a baby will live six weeks or six months in a womb and never have to live through this life. When do they get their spirit, their soul? I don't know, right? But you can see in the scriptures things like John the Baptist, right, and, and Jesus communicating in the womb. You can, you can see lots of songs like, you knew me before you knit me together in my mother's womb. You knit me together in my mother's womb. Those things alone tell you. So I need to say this to you in truth, okay? When you abort, you're interfering with a miracle, And you did 
one of the six things God doesn't really hates for you to do. Oh, man, I did it. Woe is me, Will. Okay, let's come back. Let's grab on to this, okay? Because please understand, feet that make haste to run to evil, what, what's that look like? Like, not rhetorically, but what is that? what's an example of what people do? In the, well, we'll talk about people, not about me, right? Because that's too personal. What do people do? What's that? Right? I was just saying, yeah, I was just saying. Yeah, like you run towards temptation. Whatever. So you want to avoid, but, but if you make haste towards it, you go towards it. Oh, well, I have a real drinking problem. Okay. Did you trip into the bar? No, I drove there. Like, that's that. But dang you for getting an abortion. Or you lie all the time. A false witness who brings out lies, right? Somebody who has a ministry out there who's like, man, the Lord is like doing all these things, even in the name of God. Like, that's as evil as the person who gave the abortion. Every one of them need to come hide behind the grace of God and grab on this. Right? So the truth I need to say in love is yes. Okay? Yes. Anytime somebody asks you, is abortion okay? You'd be honest. No, it's not. And here's why. Don't do it yourself. Right? But ultimately, you know how we can, you know how we can actually do this? Is uh, what's naturally happening, you see what the Jew, God had the Jews do? Is he had them be fruitful and multiply because when they had kids, it gave them one military power, but they began to outnumber. The problem is the culture is a majority-based issue. Okay? When I was born, my entire life, it's been legal to get an abortion. And I have a gray beard. This is not a new thing. Okay? Culture's decided since then, the majority of the people say, I don't want you telling me I can't do this. But they'll try it. <laughs> right? Am, am I wrong? Okay? I wish to God it would change. And every time they want to ask me or I get to vote, I will stand for it. I will not shoot an abortion doctor. Right? More than <laughs> Practi yeah. No, but what I want to know, now where I do have an effect, you see, is I want to live in such a way, I'm telling you that the major cause of abortion is actually sexual immorality. And the major cause of that is I don't believe God, what he says. Right? There's lots of reasons why women get abortions, but if they were raped, sexual morality. If they had sex with somebody that they weren't ready to be married and start a family with, sexual morality. Adultery, sexual morality. Right? Now, okay, there can always be an exception. So, I mean, we want to talk about this issue, but we don't want to deal with our own sexual sexuality. In our homes, if we could deal with what is and understand one another, and actually the kids we raise, and if we we're actually doing this, and we're doing a really bad job about this, we were talking about this this week, like sharing our faith with other people, as they came into knowing Christ and being part of the church, whether they came to the church building or not, they would begin to see things differently. They'd say, you know what? Everywhere I go, I'm going to stand up for truth. That abortion is wrong. I want these girls and these guys to know this isn't like a condom or a birth control pill. There's actually a baby there that you killed. It's a different thing. Like, let's give them the science behind it so they know. Then they can make a better decision. And one by one, as people come to faith in God and give their lives to him and give their sexuality to him, even though they're not going to do it perfectly, we're going to know. And if you won more of the culture this way, then our, our laws would change. But we haven't been able to do that in like 44 years, so and it doesn't seem to be going the right direction at this point. Maybe like some little pockets. So by all means, let's fight, a, let's fight for it, but let's not make it the major issue. And I know that's why this came in there, because it's like, oh, these babies are dying. All innocent blood, man. Like even in war, there's little kids that are dying. Innocent blood's being spilled. It's on that list too. Okay, next, next issue. Once again, why I'm tying this together is because I'm telling you the homosexuality issue is because of our broken sexuality, right? Fact of the matter, guys, and someone needs to tell you this. Kids, I know that the new what is is that I can choose 
my sexuality, right? Because the culture says that, or, or not, this is the new what should be, is like, okay, people can do all sorts of different things with their sexuality. There's all the names for it, and they do it. But I'm telling you, it's not what should be, it's what is. And there's a big difference here. Because please understand, and I think all of us, whether you're married, single, divorced, you're going to be single the rest of your life, please understand that without overcomplicating it, God gave us our sexuality, and it does two, th- it does two major things. One, it, it procreates, right? Okay? It, it's a beautiful metaphor in our marriage union, but it unites and it gives pleasure at the same time. Your body is made with certain nerve endings in a certain way that have nothing to do with, pro, with procreation. And it's all about that pleasure and that connection. And when you do that, there's a spiritual and physical connection that happens and an emotional connection. That's why it's reserved for marriage. But if you don't believe that, then lots of things can trigger your nerve endings. It doesn't have to be the opposite sex. It doesn't even have to be a human. You could do it yourself. Right? Okay, now I'm offending, but you guys with me still? You, am I speaking the truth to you, right? Okay. So you see the danger with our broken sexuality is where we've shifted what should be to something completely different. Okay, well, but, you know, but what about this and what about that? And let me just say this, okay? I don't know what it feels like. To, to have same-sex attraction. I don't know. And theoretically, I can read it, and there's lots of uh, explanations that the psychology world tries to, tries to throw out there about things of your past or what's happened, and that may or may not be true, okay? And that's not my job. I'm not a counselor or a, or a psychologist. I get, I get opposite sex attraction, though. I got a bad, Derek. I like my wife a lot, right? Like, I get that, but I don't get the same sex attraction. So I say this in a purely theoretical, okay? But I can stand on the truth of God who does know us. Who even though maybe we had abuse or hurt or broken relationships and it's, it's causing us to drift towards that same-sex attraction, God knows how to walk you through it. I don't. So let me tell you what this says. Here's one of the areas. And there's a lot of places it talks about this. Whereas abortion, that word's not used. It's just, you know, the killing of innocence and, and murder itself. That's where it talks about. But homosexuality is really used in a lot of places. Another letter to Christians in Rome, it says this, Romans 1, 26 through 28, for this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions. You see that? There's sexual immorality. We're not handling that right. We're not doing it in marriage, so we're doing it on the outside. And then we get these passions. We think it's okay. We try these things. So they, because, because they chose to disobey God, worship idols, and go to other things, God gave them over to their dishonorable passions. For their women exchanged natural relations to those who were contrary to nature, for those that are contrary to nature. And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another. Men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. Okay. So I, I think it's, when you read that, is it pretty clear from Paul's perspective of what God showed him that God is not for this lifestyle? Okay. So what do you do about those with same-sex attraction? Oh, man, Right? And then 1 Corinthians, let me show you another verse. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, either the sexually immoral or idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor the drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you but you were washed and you were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. We would love to use this because we want to pick on one of those groups, but listen to it. Okay, count with me, Derek. Uh, 
sexual immoral, idolaters, adulterers, men who practice homosexuality, thieves, greedy, drunkards, revilers, what that's eight, nine swindlers, nine people, nine different groups there, nine different things you can do, that when that's the habit of your life, it's saying you're not going to inherit the goodness of the kingdom of heaven, right? You're not following God into the kingdom. You're going in the opposite way. And then it goes on, such were some of you. So before you start throwing rocks from your glass house, please understand there's a good chance if you, if you go with your own propensity to struggle and sin, you might end up in one of those nine categories. Like I said, the person who's practicing a lot of heterosexual sexual morality is quick to throw stones at the person practicing homosexuality, sexual immorality. Those who are drunkard is talking smack about both of those other groups. And according to this, all of those are pathways of destruction. And the data would show that, right? You watch the people around you who live in those patterns. It doesn't end up well for them. It doesn't age well for them. Okay. So I think in terms, guys, we have to understand homosexuality is an action. And so this is not the topic, complete topic of today's sermon. What I wanted to tell you is I think every one of us has this sexual brokenness. And so this is one of the areas. So I'm bringing in these areas. Same-sex attraction is a serious thing, right? It's a serious thing, and I don't understand it completely. But what I do understand is this. I understand that just because I feel attracted to somebody doesn't mean I need to sin because of that. I think of Jesus, the prostitutes, okay? Like, listen, I may be a pastor, but like Jesus found this woman committing adultery. He took a naked woman and sitting out in the street, and he's sitting here staring at her like this, and she's naked. Like, he didn't notice that, okay? He's surrounded by prostitutes, man. Prostitutes, they know how to use their womenly wiles, and it's, and it's their best trick. No doubt they were trying this on him. Facts, Right? But still, he didn't sin because he didn't do anything about it. He didn't get caught up in that. So I do think if you are a Christian who is struggling with same-sex attraction, it's a very difficult thing. And that's not something for that I can necessarily walk you through. But let me encourage you that you're not sinning in a worse way than the person who is struggling with heterosexual sexual immorality. And so if you need that kind of help, man, see me, and let's see if we can get people who understand that more. Because just because you feel that doesn't mean you need to act on that. No different than a married man or a woman can have feelings about somebody they're not married to or see or feel attraction to someone they're not married to. But they must stop that before it dwells in their hearts or before they commit adultery like in their fantasy or actually physically. Does that make sense? So whether I'm struggling, where I, I feel attracted, you know, Like, I don't get it. I think you guys are disgusting. But girls, I think, are beautiful, right? So I have that kind of issue. I think my wife, I love my wife, but that doesn't mean since we've been married, I haven't noticed there's a pretty girl in the world. And that's my job to be with the Lord and process that in a way that's not sinful, to look away at times. And a lot of times I fail epically. Come back. Please, God, please, sorry. Help me. Because when you see any of these people, understand this. And such were some of you. But you were washed and you were sanctified and you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Okay, so now there's the next thing here. Now, um, gender confusion or gender dysphoria. This is, this is pretty, this is prevalent. Some of it is in the homosexual community. Some of it actually has nothing to do with that. I spend time in the high school substituting. And it is, a, it is a new option for young people who aren't sexual at all to go this way, to say, I think I'm a male and not a female. Or I'm neither one, I'm non-binary, I'm somewhere floating in the middle. Now the facts are, there are chromosome tests that will tell you, they'll help you out. Like really, that's, that is a fact. But I know also because we've given ourselves over to a debased mind and because we're rebellious to God and because we think we know better, we want to tell him, and I don't care what you say, God. I don't even think you're real. I want to choose this myself. Now, I, like I said, I don't experience this. I haven't studied this extensively. 
But I, what I don't want to do is be the Christian throwing rocks. Because what I found, interestingly enough, this is, this is Will's perspective, okay? Not backed by the scripture necessarily, not backed by a psychological study. I've talked to these young, and at the high school I go to, there's a lot of women who, young women who, um, maybe in my day, they would, have, they would have done something different. But what they've done is they haven't maybe fit in with like the standard cultural beauty and pretty girl thing or whatever, maybe. So you talk to them, and a lot of what they're doing, trying to be non-binary, is, is to be seen and to be special. And we do that, right? If we, can't, if we can't excel in the primary way, right? And it still works like this in school. Like, okay, the girls who, the girls who uh, have the symmetrical looks and like, right, the right type of body type and are popular, that's still like the fast track to feeling special. The reality is they don't feel special. But that's what everyone thinks that's not on their track. And then the guy, the bigger, the stronger, more athletic guy is still the alpha male and female. And so everyone wants to go in that path. And some people are happy to be second or third place. Other people are constantly saying, I don't want to play your game. And they create sub-communities. Sub when I went to school, you had all the Nirvana grunge kids, right? Then you had the trench coat kids. Then you had the kids wearing the no fear. Then you had kids like me who were white, but for some reason always listened to rap music and sagged our pants. We wanted to be special in subcategories. And so talking to some of these young people, what's sad and what's scary is because our culture has told them that marriage is not the way to do this, heterosexual marriage, they have all these options now. So they're like 10 and not sexual either way, but they think it's really cool to wear the combat boots and get purple hair. And so they say they're trans, but they never intend on transitioning to the other gender. Is it, am, I, am I speaking, is that kind of true? You talk to some of them, it's like, no. And they're not even necessarily, don't, not all of them don't even have a girlfriend or boyfriend of the same sex. It's, it's become a, a social movement, Right? So instead of trashing them, let's be about something instead of against something. See? Deal with my sin and stand for truth from love. Like, I've found so cool, and I've shared that with you, like talking with different people, man. And when they start to see that you love them, I'm dealing with my own sin, and I'm offering them love. They know, they kind of know what I'm about. They think I'm a priest because they don't have faith, right? Oh, you're a priest, right? No, it's not the same thing. But anyway, we won't get into that now. But how come, you know, you treat me with compassion? How come my son, Tyler, who goes to school with them, treats him with compassion when the other Christians say, no, 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 even like 13-year-old Christians, wrong, that's wrong, that's wrong. The Bible says you're going to hell. Da, da. It doesn't work. They've never been in church. They'll never come here. And some of it's our fault. Let's not be against something. What you want to be against is sin controlling you. That's what you want to be in. And you want to be for truth. See, so what, what should be is what I'm considering when I look at myself. And being a disciple maker, which is really what we need to get back to, then I'm going to teach the people I'm living life with, like, we're all doing this together. Like, what should be is what I'm working on in me, Josh. And if you're in my life, man, we have that brotherhood. I might ask you to say, I notice you, Will, not doing the what you should be doing. And I'll challenge you, man, to work on that area. But someone over here that I haven't met, I can't be like, well, let me tell you what you're doing wrong. What is, is where I offer compassion and grace because we can't forget what, one of the things the scripture tells us is, is God is not slow to come back, to react, to make, I'm paraphrasing, to make things right in this world, to show truth once and for all. He's not slow to do that. He's what? Patient. So when you see someone in one of those categories, and you see yourself in that, be grateful that God hasn't come to end it. Because if I'm on that list of nine, on that list of seven, and I want God to come back to knock off some other group in that list, he's not going to be selective, my friends. What benefits me is I have that protection of Jesus, that when he looks at me, he sees Jesus. So, I want the praise team to come on back up. I know whoever put those, those suggestions in is really angry because I didn't like 
trash on everyone, but, but here's what I think God is, not, I don't think, I don't want to change my words. I know, okay, I know that this is true. I know for a fact with every ounce of my spirit, soul, and being that this is true. Like, if we are going to grow in Christ, and if we're going to grow his kingdom, right, to join Jesus in his work as he's beginning to live life differently, we need to change. Each one of us need to change. Christianity is a changing game. If you're not a Christian, you're here. You haven't heard that before, maybe, or you've heard it and they don't do it. Each one of us has to look at ourselves and say, this is what should be. And what should be is that I'm growing in Christ and that I'm practicing. My wife gave me a good metaphor. She says, you know about your metaphor where you're practicing? Because I was talking about baseball, and I said, you know, when you're practicing something, so you see what is. And the pastor, he needs to tell you, he needs to tell you what should be and what is. But every time we talk about what is, let's go back to what should be. Yeah, that is my job. Now, you know, that way you can go away from here looking at, oh, man, where, am I, where have I settled for what is when I should be practicing what should be? Where am I okay with what the world's telling me is true when I should be pursuing God's truth? And once I do that, I don't get it overnight. This is a process, a lifelong process. And so I likened it to practicing. We like to do that at my house, practicing. And she says, you know, the one thing about your metaphor, he was talking about hitting a baseball, because I loved baseball growing up, right? And I said, you know, the, the nice thing about that, which helps me in this area, is if I play baseball and I hit the ball half the time, then I'm in the Hall of Fame, right? So there's a lot of grace in that, that when I make a mistake, I get back up to bat. Because I had to do that as a kid, man. You struck out one time, sure enough, eight more batters came through, you were up to try it again. She goes, the only difference is this, Will. If you keep striking out, she says, you got to figure out what are you, how are you swinging wrong. I didn't even tell her that I was going to use that, so now she'll see. But I thought she was brilliant because I do that. I find that. I think I'm practicing, but I'm swinging all wrong, and I keep missing it. And so that's what I want to bring to you. You're swinging wrong if you're not hitting it. And so what I want you to take away from this is that each one of us, that we could take this time and... I just want to, it could be too much. So what I'd love us to do is we're going to pray. Okay, they'll play like quietly. We'll pray. And if you'll join me, what I'm going to pray, anyone who wants to pray, I'm going to stick my hands out like this. Nothing magic happens. One thing is I look silly, which means I've come to the end of myself, which is what God is saying. Like, put down your pride. Come to the end of yourself. Quit quit trying to be so cool, Will, because you're not. Okay, so I'm going to put my hands out and say, God, like, I want to give you all of my thoughts and views on sexuality. I want to give you the way that I'm practicing it, thinking about it. I give it to you. I release it to you. Take it from me, Lord. And I pray that your spirit and your power that lives inside of me would give it back to me in truth, that would help me, that would guide me and lead me in new ways of thinking and new ways of practicing it. Is that too much? Is that? And then see what he does. It's, you'll, you might have to do it again in 10 minutes when you leave. But that's the life of a Christian, right? It's a walk. So here, let's pray. Father, I, man, I pray, Lord, that, you're, that you would eradicate like abortion from the world, that no one would ever kill an unborn baby. I, I, I pray that, you know, even more so, Lord, I pray that Christians would, would put it in its proper perspective, Lord, that we wouldn't be casting stones at people's sin when we're sitting over here in our own sin. And Lord, I pray that you would just be with everyone, Lord, who is struggling with overactive same-sex attraction and those who are suffering with opposite-sex attraction in an unhealthy way. 
I pray, Lord, that they would bring that struggle into the light with someone they can trust so they could begin to practice doing this differently, Lord, that they would begin to honor that, Lord. I pray that you would bless our marriages with your power, Lord. I pray that we would love one another, that we would be understanding with one another and that the world would see that love is good and that marriage is good, Lord, and that it would draw people back to what you created this marriage, Lord, man and woman together for a lifetime. I pray that you'd use us believers, Lord, that we would model this and live it, but also talk about the struggles with people that we know, but about the goodness of God in that, I pray. And so, Lord, I just, I just do this myself and I invite everyone, all, all the people, even if they don't know you, if they believe what I'm saying is true, that we would just come before you and say, God, man, like there is some brokenness and disobedience and confusion with sex in our culture and in our world. And more importantly, confusion and struggle and disobedience in the way I'm handling my sexuality. And so, Lord, you say that if we confess it, that you're faithful to forgive us. And so I see it, Lord. I see it in me. I see I have the wrong view of it, Lord. I see that it takes too much weight. I see that I see that I'm, I'm a sucker for what the culture is doing. It makes you think about that and focus on that too much when there's so many other good things, Lord. And I agree in the past, I've, I've thought and said things that I shouldn't have and done things that I shouldn't have, Lord. And I ask you to forgive me. I ask you to just wash me even from my sins of this week, Lord. And Lord, I put my hands out and I just give that to you. I give you all my thoughts about sex, all my experiences, the good times and the bad, all my worries, anxieties. Focus, I give that to you, Lord, everything. I give it to you. Please take it, Lord. And Lord, I pray now that you would just cleanse me. That that's out, that you just wash me clean with your love, Lord. The scripture talks about an image of of these living waters that flow out from the throne, you know, down the hill and through the trees and then off. It's as if it's coming down to earth and it's just, it's washing clean and bringing life to every believer. And so Lord, I pray that you would just wash us all clean from our, our sexual sin, Lord. And I pray that in the minutes and hours to come that you would begin to give us back maybe a new perspective, a new appreciation for sexuality as you had made it, Lord. Because if we deal this within ourselves, that's all we can do. So Lord, forgive us for doing it our way and not doing your way. Forgive us for the pride of it, Lord, that we know better than you do. Forgive us for that, Lord. Build us up in your strength and your love, I pray in Jesus' name, amen.